My series on the Ocean Gate Titan submersible wouldn't be complete if I didn't also go over the internal and external wiring and power systems because I find them to be rather interesting. The media outlets, for example, seem to love ridiculing the use of a game controller for the navigation, but it is a rather clever hack that the APLUW engineers came up with for the Cyclops submersible, which I believe was just simply adapted to the Titan. I'm not sure that it is understood by many what exactly was going on inside the Titan either, which is also interesting in its own way. I will now present an overview of the internal and external systems using some block diagrams that I created. I got most of this information from either Bruce Morton, the former OceanGate engineer, or from APLUW collaborative videos on YouTube. There is still a little bit of guesswork involved here as well, but I think most of it is pretty self-evident from the information I have gathered. So let's start with the navigation system, also known as the thrusters. This system was designed by APLUW principal engineer Pete Brodsky for the Cyclops sometime around 2015, as far as I can tell. I'm confident that the Titan used pretty much the same system. The challenge here for the designers was interfacing a game controller with the rest of the systems. In this diagram, we can see the basic scheme. It starts out with two big batteries in the tail section, as can be seen here. These were apparently 120 volt DC, and some of that power went to a DC-DC converter, which knocked it down to 24 volts. This, in turn, fed two power supplies in each control housing, which supplied 5 volts to the Ethernet. The Ethernet was the interface to the analog controls of the thrusters. Then there's these Ethernet switches. I'm not sure what the game controller actually communicated with. The thrusters are supplied with the 120 volt 40 amp pair, which is a surprisingly large power draw. Seems to me you would need to be judicious in using these thrusters to conserve battery life. Um, I assume there was two batteries for redundancy, so there would need to be two different power buses, and I surmise one of the reasons for having the breakers. It's not clear to me if the batteries could be used simultaneously or not. I would imagine so, but I just don't know. Other external systems included a high-pressure air tank, what I assume is two air bladders, a set of air valves, the two control spheres on the top, and those orange covers, and hydraulic fluid-filled J-boxes. I believe that the hydraulic pump was located here. It appears that tubing goes to that device from the port in the interface ring. Moving on to the interior systems, I know even less of the details, but I have enough info to put together a block diagram. Once again, we start with the batteries that were hidden under the deck. I believe they were strictly for the internal systems, such as computers lighting the fan on the box of sodasorb, which is calcium hydroxide. I assume they were also 120 volts since that is what computers in the US are designed to operate on. There were probably also a power supply that provided a lower voltage to peripherals, but I'm not sure. As with the batteries in the tail, I imagine there was redundancy built in with two power buses and a set of breakers. At the heart of the internal systems was three computers. According to Stockton Rush, they were using both Linux and Windows operating systems. I suspect one computer was dedicated to the real-time monitoring system. There were also three monitors, two keyboards, network and Wi-Fi, and according to Bruce Morton, there was what he called a sonar modem, which was used to communicate with the surface. Now, this was a system of texting rather than voice communication. Apparently, Stockton felt that voice communication detracted from the experience, so he didn't want it. The infamous game controller used to navigate the sub was also tied into this system somehow. There was media, which I assume meant the cameras and lighting inside. Miscellaneous monitoring included oxygen, carbon dioxide, humidity, temperature, and pressure inside the crew compartment. Now we come to the main thing that I really wanted to get into, the patented system of strain gauges and acoustic sensors that comprise the real-time monitoring system also known as RTM. This was intended to prevent a catastrophe by continuously monitoring the condition of the carbon fiber hull. Apparently when these carbon fibers break, they make ultrasonic noises, which these sensors were supposed to detect. 
According to the patent documents, the center frequency was 150 kilohertz. According to Stockton, there was 1,500 meters before a hole failure would occur, meaning that there was a buffer that in theory would give them plenty of time to ascend to a safer depth and thus prevent a hole breach. This was based on a lot of testing he did at the APLUW labs with the carbon fiber holes. I'm assuming the one-third scale holes. From what I have gathered through combing over various interviews, these fibers would make noise and then quiet down. But whether that was happening on every dive or just the first few, I can't really determine. If it was every dive, that would be an indication of cyclic fatigue, and at some point the hole would just be too compromised to continue to remain in service. But just how does one determine exactly where that point is? In an interview with David Pogue in July of 2022, um, Stockton Rush said that there was eight acoustic sensors. So why was there eight of these acoustic sensors? Well, according to Stockton, it was likely because the load paths in a cylinder is all octagonal, in his words. Okay, so that makes some sense. That would explain why there were eight sensors. I'm not sure where or how many strain gauges there were. I imagine maybe also eight of those, but I have no idea. Looking at the patent Stockton filed in uh, September of 2021, the idea here was to continuously monitor the hole and store the data so they could be compared with the data gathered on previous dives and so on. On the surface, it seems to be a pretty solid concept. However, the X factor is what will the carbon do in the real world? You can run simulations on a supercomputer for 24 hours and so on, but real world results can still be different. Technology does have its limits. So in the transcript, when it is mentioning global RTM all red, it would indicate that all of the sensors were detecting activity. Normal protocol would have been to ascend to a safer depth and call off the dive, and in theory, there would have been plenty of time to turn the situation around. If all eight acoustic sensors are active and the strain gauges are all going berserk, it would indicate a crisis and all emergency protocols come into play. This means we need to get to the surface now. So that means dropping the ballast cage and then the frame if necessary. All of these things do line up with the transcript. Um, now, according to Stockton, nothing penetrated the, the carbon fiber part of the hole. He said so himself in that July 2022 20, interview. In Stockton's prior testing in the previous years, he found that any openings in the carbon fiber led to a failure. So their data connections were done strictly through the titanium. One thing I've not been able to determine thus far is the hydraulic and pneumatic systems for the emergency pin removal to drop the ballast cage and legs. Some have suggested it was manually done and I believe it was automated. There was only so much room in the back of the hole where the computers were and under the deck where the batteries lived for the internal systems and the oxygen bottles. I don't know where such pumps could be located or, or how large they would be, um, but I suppose it's possible they were crammed in there somewhere. Finally, there are some life support items. The fan-powered box of Sodazorb, which removed O2, appears to have lived in the uh, computer bay and there was one oxygen bottle enough for a 10 to 12 hour dive, which you can see here, and then the four oxygen bottles under the deck, which could provide oxygen for up to 72 hours. I hope you found this video interesting and informative. I myself wasn't clear on exactly what comprised the internal and external systems, how they worked, and whether or not things had to get from inside the hole to the outside and by what means they did so. So this cleared up a lot of questions in my own mind. So with that, I thank you for watching. Please leave comments and we'll see you next time.